When it comes to money, what's the one thing you need to know to make sure you deal with it properly and you don't lose sight of really what matters? <laughs> you know, it, you could probably say a lot of things. You, you probably say invest it, make sure that you take care of it, that you don't spend it all. Nah, that's not the answer. Actually, the one thing you need to do when it comes to money, we gonna talk about today. And so I wanna thank you for joining me again for another time of word inspiration and enrichment. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to be with you and share with you these nuggets and, and really kind of bring you along in the journey of my experience in being enriched and inspired by the word of truth. That's really what it is. And I will say this before I pray and jump into the message. There is a reflective experience that I have in sharing these messages because in many instances, there's a, a wrestling with the thought processes and the perspectives. But in that being something of great value, it's so important to understand that the truth is greater than us. And so we're going to see that today in our subject matter that we're going to focus on in regard to the one thing we must do with regard to money. All right. And so let's pray for our time together and then we're going to jump into this message. Our Father, we give you thanks. Give you thanks for your good, even when it doesn't feel like you're good. Our feelings are not the determinant of who you are. Who you are is who you are, regardless of what we think you made us, and that's what matters. And so because what matters is what it is that you believe, you think, you know, and you do, we give you thanks. And so... As we talk about this one thing that we must do with regard to money, bless us, bless our hearing, bless our receiving, bless our believing, bless our doing, bless our thinking, bless our delivering. To the praise of your glory and to the benefit that comes with it for us, we give you thanks in Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, I think that if we're going to really talk about money, there's something else we need to talk about in regard to money. Now, we've talked about in a past message that we need to understand that God is our master, money is to be our slave, right? So God is our master, money is to be our slave. God is our master, money is to be our slave. And in the context of that, why should we have God as our master? Well, he created us, right? But there's some other things I think we need to understand that gives us even a perspective about how we use money, why we need money, why money is something that is in the context of all that we do. Money is... I have come to understand is a critical and pivotal element of our lives. However, it can become, like I said, one of, one of my good friends told me it's tricky. It can become a focal point beyond what it's designed to be. And the only way it really becomes the focal point of what it's not designed to be is if we don't do this one thing. Now, what is that one thing? Let me read some passages for you, and then I'll tell you what that one thing is. First, I want to read Job, the 42nd chapter, with a couple verses there, and then... I'll give you some perspective about it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, you heard me say that this was Job. Very important because Job, we know, was a very influential man, a man of means, a man of substance, a man of influence with people, servants. He, he had much that he had acquired and accumulated such that his children, each one of his sons, had their own house. <laughs> And, and they gathered daily with their sisters among themselves at each house, but in a different manner, a different day. So I think it was like seven sons, something like that. But each one of his sons had their own house. And so the three sisters would come over and they would be a part of the, the experience, but they would be at different houses every day, right? I mean, they were just having a good time. Now, we know from our observance of the story that Job's children were destroyed at one of the homes. Um, he ended up having servants and many of his cattle taken by thieves and bandits. And I mean, it, it became bad. And I'm talking about like he lost everything. And, and many say in the space of one day, I don't really have the record or haven't seen that in my studies that it was one day, but in a very short amount of time, he lost technically a majority of his substance. It's like he went bankrupt. Okay. Now, to add insult to injury in the context of human nature, he doesn't just lose all of his stuff. He also ends up being afflicted in his body in a way that he did not contribute to. We know this because at the beginning of Job, we're told that this was the adversary, Satan, who had been given liberty by God to attack Job. Man. Wow. He here it is, God allows for Job's wealth, substance, means, his, his strength of finances, like being self-sufficient, having to not having to worry about anything. He literally has nothing. Even his friends think that he is like cursed God and he needs to just... Or, or, or he's done wrong. He sinned in some way that he's deserved what he's experiencing. So this point that we read, there was a number of experiences Job had. He even had encouragement from a young friend who spoke some words of um, consolation, encouragement, even conviction. Somewhat of condemnation, too, because he was not thinking rightly about his situation. Then God comes direct to him and checks him. Whew, that's a very challenging situation. And here's Job's response, what we just read. The first thing Job acknowledges is God can do everything. And that no purpose of his were, will ever be overthrown. That means that whatever is happening to us is not greater than what God's purpose is. To the degree that he's saying that what's happening to us is in God's purpose. <sighs> what's happening to us is in God's purpose. In that being the case, he then says, okay, this is what you said, God. He, he repeats what God said. Who is this that hides counsel um, without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And then God also said, oh, oh that's where he said, therefore, I've uttered 
what I did not understand. So he says what God says. And then in saying what God says, there's this aspect of him acknowledging what he thinks about it now as compared to when he said something or how he felt before. Right. In other words, he's saying that before I got to this point, as I began to deal with my experiences and things that I was going through, I was saying things that communicated that I was not really giving regard to who I am and who God is. Woo. He didn't really know why he was going through. However, though he did not know why he was going through, it did not discount that there was a reason from God. Even when he says and repeats what God said here and I will speak, I will question you and you make it known to me. He goes on and says, you know, never have I heard God speak to me this way. <laughs> not, not only never have I heard God speak to me this way, God spoke to me in such a way that it transformed me and caused me to see really who and what I was and what it is that I needed to be thinking and doing. Mm. Most important part here is he said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted, can be overcome, can be overthrown, can be resisted. Mm. But let me read a second passage to you. This is King Solomon, who at the beginning of his life was absolutely devoted to God, sold out to him. God made him profoundly wealthy as a result. But then there was this aspect of um, turning away from God at a certain point in his life. And that turning away, he went after the gods. He married women from other nations i mean he had on i don't know i can't even remember how many wives and concubines and all of that i mean he just gave himself over to whatever he felt and then he returned to the lord in repentance and faith and he wrote the book of ecclesiastes as a a contrasting a juxtaposition of his thought processes versus the way he should think and the frustrations that go with that and at the end of it, he says this, and I'm still reading from the English Standard Version. The end of the matter, all has been heard, Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Listen, I love how the King James Version says that hear the conclusion of the matter. All has been said. Fear God. Keep his commandments, <laughs> for this is the whole duty of man. The conclusion of the matter is this. All has been said. Kind of sounds like Job. Know that you can do everything. You know, there's a conclusion here. here. Here's the conclusion. The conclusion is that God is the authority of all things. And that is this. We have our part to play in a number of things. We have our part to play in what we do, how we do, why we do in a lot of respects, because God has designed that we be contributors with him, that we be an extension of him. So we must engage ourselves. We must work. We must gain. We must attain. We must achieve. All those things are, are true. But especially as it pertains to money and that of God being our master why is it that he's our master over money or over anything else is this he's in control the one thing we must do if we're going to really deal with money appropriately is this we must agree that god is in control listen he, it says, fear God and keep his commandments, for that's the whole duty of man. But then he can do everything. God can do everything. It doesn't say that man can do everything. Job acknowledged that God could do everything and that he could not because he couldn't get himself out of the situation. And when I say he could not get himself out of the situation, no effort 
that he could give could stop what was happening to him until God was done with it happening to him. No effort. Nothing he could do. Here's what he did do. He did acknowledge that God was in control. Look at it. He says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. And he's not talking about eye like these eyes. He's talking about eye, the mind's eye. We talked about this earlier in the year uh, when we were talking about the mind. So do go back and check out that message earlier in the year. I think it was around uh, January, uh, probably around February. But go check it out. Uh, he's talking about the mind's eye where, where Jesus even says, if thine eye be single, th thy whole your whole body be full of light. What he's saying is my whole body is now full of light in the awareness and understanding that you can do all things. Meaning you can bring me to ruin if you desire. Even if I have skill, ability, the, the very context of value to be able to cre create this unique experience and, and connection with people and, and be able to earn and receive. Like God might have it to wear in the context of your work as a salesperson, as an entrepreneur. He has maybe ordained you to get no over no over no over no over no because he's dealing with who you are and what you think about yourself and what you think about money and who you really serve. You, you could be in an employment situation. And it seems like nothing's working, even though you're doing right, even though you're actually giving your best. You are growing. You are committing. You are studying, whatever the case may be. And it might cause your money to be funny, your change to be strange. Do this one thing. Make sure you know God is in control. Even when you get the money. His wisdom is designed to give you the ability to store it well. God is in control. <laughs> God is in control. Do we have responsibility? Are there expectations set for us? Are there parameters, guidelines? Absolutely. But at the core, when it comes to money and anything else, do this one thing. Remember, acknowledge, have awareness that God is in control. God is in control. God is in control. Job tells us something so profound. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be overthrown. No purpose of God's can be overthrown. Ours can be overthrown, but no purpose of God can. So if we know he's in control, we deal with him as he's in control, and we deal with our endeavors and our efforts as he's in control, and that means even his wisdom is really what is in control. His perspective, his ideals, his thought process, his feelings, his beliefs, his wisdom, everything, he's in control, then we can see money appropriately because he actually established what money is and what it is for. So, let me tell you what happened to Job, though. And people like to talk about this. It says that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. Oh, not because he actually <laughs> did well. He was obedient in an area that God expected him to be obedient in beyond that of any financial benefit or gain. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before and came to him, all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. It's a lot of rings of gold. Watch this. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. 
He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapush. And in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons for generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. Will the same be said of us? Not so much all the little details of how much and all of that. It's more so, will it be said of us that when we die, we die an old person? More importantly, full of days. Full of days actually is a reference to he lived his life fully. He, he lived his life where he exhausted. It's this term where you live full, die empty, where you really contribute consistent with the potential that God has invested in you, has put in you, and you live at that level really adding value. You see, ultimately, what I want to encourage is in understanding that God is in control, God is in control of really why we're here, what our purpose is. And our financial needs are very important. But the truth is, are we serving others? When you look at where it said Job prayed for his friends, the question is, are we serving others in the way that God has ordained that we serve them? Because when we serve others in the way that God has ordained we serve them, we will get the reward that comes with that. God is in control. God is in control of the sowing and the reaping more so. He's in control of sowing being a process, reaping being a process, and what the reaping looks like from the sowing. He's established those parameters. Th the truth is, the world did not establish the parameters about money. God did. The world may facilitate it, but God established it. Like, we got to live above the ideals of the environment we grew up in. And I tell you, that's been a challenge for me. But I tell you this, do this one thing with regard to money. Remember that God is in control. All right? All right. So let me get off the podium and, and let's pray for our time together and then or pray, give thanks, and then we get out of here. Father, we give you thanks for how you have kept us how you've given us such a wonderful reality of awareness about what's really more important beyond money. Consistent with that awareness of, you know, you can't serve God in money. You, you either love the one, hate the other, hold to the one, despise the other. And so, God, give us to love you and hold to you. Give us to despise money, to hate money in the sense that we do not allow it to be our authority, but in our relationship, give us to love it as you love us. Love it dearly, making sure that we use it for the purpose it is most valuable to be used and give it purpose consistent with its intended end. More than anything, let us remember that you are in control, meaning you set the parameters, you set the structure and the strategy, and by us giving regard to it in that way, you will, you will, you will not only be glorified, but you will release benefit to us, and we give you thanks for that, and we pray this in Christ Jesus, amen. All right, as I often say, you go be blessed to be a blessing, make sure you like, share, Comment, subscribe, hit the bell notification, do all the YouTube -y stuff, all right? <laughs> and then you be great. You hit me now. Take care.